school name, which takes its name from a, a grammar school that was set up here by somebody called Stephen Purse, and we still have a Purse grammar school, not in this site. This particular part of the lane has this wonderful jettied house, a house that goes out in different stories. And right at the top, last window, that would have been the nursery for um, the Bell family. In the 19th century, there was a family here who had 11 children, and one of them was called Alice Bell. Now, the, the subject of the um, science week is actually the world of science, so I'm, I'm at this point going to move the story to Australia. Alice Bell, when she was just 12 years old, was introduced to her cousin, a distant cousin called Charles Todd. And he was a, a rather gauche young man who used to come and visit sometimes. And Alice's mother would entertain him, give him tea. And what the story is... What does gauche mean? Gauche. Ah, oh, awkward. Um, you know, not a very comfortable sort of person. And on one occasion when he came to, to tea, he, um, he said, well... Alice's mother said, I think you need somebody to look after you. You need a wife. And he said, well, I don't know who would marry me. And Alice, being 12, leapt up from behind the sofa and said, oh, Mr. Todd, I will marry you. Well, at 12, of course, that couldn't be. But six years later, he came back on another visit and announced that he had just been awarded the, the post in Australia for setting up the telegraph poles from Adelaide to Darwin. And being 18 this time, Alice thought that this was a big adventure. So she volunteered again and was accepted. So they did get married in 1855 and set off to Australia. Now, in Australia, he went and did his task of setting up these, uh, the telegraph line. And in the middle of Australia, when he came to springs that had no name, he named them for his wife, Alice, and we get Alice Springs. In time, being a happy marriage, they had children. And one of these, Winnie, when she was 17, she met somebody who was always known by the family as the Fresser. He was a professor. And he was William Bragg from another English family who'd gone to Australia. And Alice, uh, Alice's daughter, Gwenny, and William Bragg got married. Now, William Bragg had actually managed to entertain his future family by taking along this box that he used in his uh, scientific work. And if you put your hand into it, you could see all the bones. He was into using x-rays. And this was quite fun. It was a party trick that you could show off, you know, the bones in your hand. Well, it probably wasn't a very good idea. We know now you shouldn't have too much exposure. But this was his field of study. Now, in time, they had children. One of them, William Lawrence Bragg, like his father, was interested in this use of x-rays. And the two of them developed x-ray crystallography. Now, the story moves on to a worldwide theme when we, we talk about the First World War, because uh, Lawrence Bragg found himself at the front. Um, and on a day in November 1915, he saw the, the Padre cycling towards him, who sadly brought him the news that his brother had died. Two weeks later, he saw the same Padre cycling towards him, and he thought, well, what has happened this time? This time, he was bearing the news that both father and son had been awarded a Nobel Prize for their work in X-ray crystallography. Now, they came back to England, and in fact, Lawrence Bragg was uh, later in his career to be the head of the Cavendish Laboratory, which is where we're heading now. So I'm going to turn you around after that long story and continue in this direction. This whole site in 1760 would have been a garden. It was the first botanic garden developed in Cambridge. It was uh, set up by Richard Walker in 1760. Well, less than 100 years later, the, well, no, sorry, just slightly more than 100 years later, around 1870, the university decided that it would develop some science buildings and took over this site. We now call this the New Museums site. But they have left this small corner, and apparently all the plants here appeared on that first list in 1760 when Richard Walker set up his garden. It would have been a very good site to grow things because it had been a garden before it was the university garden. It was actually the garden of the Austin Priory. And that's a nice link in a way with the beginning of genetic studies uh, and DNA because uh, one of the Austin Priors uh, around 1820 was Gregor Mendel and it was his work on plants. He grew um, garden peas uh, being part of the monastery, um, he was very much a keen gardener as well as his interest in science 
and it would have suited the, uh, the kitchens, I think, to have had many, many peas growing. And he started growing them to see if you could actually alter the colour and what, what affected the, the colour. So his was the beginning of genetic work that was carried on later here. If we just see the, the entrance. This is part of the building that we refer to as the old Cavendish. We have somebody here who declared that he works in the new Cavendish. Well, they set this up, as it says there, in 1874. But 100 years later, in 1974, they had outgrown this site. So they started developing the west area, west site of, of Cambridge, which is still developing fast now. 1874, the head of the university, the chancellor, was um, William Cavendish, the seventh Duke of Devonshire. And he decided to promote the teaching of science by giving more than 8,000 pounds of his own money to develop the first laboratory for the teaching of experimental physics. Now, physics had been taught before this, but it was very much um, scattered around town of individual lectures, uh, not really very formally taught. And in this instance, you had the first laboratory set up. It was only the third in the country. There was one in Oxford, there was one in Glasgow. So this was the third, and there was nothing to base it on, a plan of what it should look like. So they handed the, the choice of um, building, or the choice of laboratory, over to the first head, and that was James Clark Maxwell. And he became a designer of um, a lecture theatre. And it's actually in through the doorway and up to the right, upstairs. And it's quite a large room, wooden panels around the, the side, because he, he said, it's no good having plaster walls, I want to be able to put notices and things up. And it has a, a long table at the bottom, and then wooden staging going up so that everybody can look down onto the experiments. And part of the, the problem then was once you've got a lot of wood in an area where you're doing physics experiments, is that wood attracts water, and it remains quite damp, and you get all the men coming in in their damp overcoats, and it makes it difficult to carry out experiments. So what they would do would be to prepare everything in a chamber above the table in a specially dry area, and then at the last minute, they would open a hatch and lower things down so that it could actually be displayed. Now, James Clark Maxwell was also given the work of um, the forebear of William Cavendish, Henry Cavendish, on his um, work to, to write up. And it was Henry Cavendish who worked out the mass of the world as six thousand the power of, six to the power of 21, six thousand million, million, million tons. So we've got the, the beginning of big names already with James Clark Maxwell, and we move through a series of people who become heads of the, the Cavendish. People like J.J. Thompson, who discovered the electron. And um, he came up with this wonderful explanation of it being a plum pudding. And if you think of the, the plum pudding, this is where you'll see my, my science knowledge is fairly thin, but I can understand that he described it as the negatively charged particles were the currents in a positively charged area, which was the, the atom. So you've got the, the positive atom around the, the negative. It was then disproved later by Ernest Rutherford. You've actually got a statue of William Cavendish up there. I don't think he'll back any further than us because there's no point. Um, and he's holding the building that he created. I'll just give you a little bit of paper so you can have a look at the tutors. And this is sort of a play of Cavan Cavendish's name and also um, meaning safety through pre uh, precaution, so leave nothing to, to chance. But in the days when the Cavendish first opened, there were not lots of businesses around creating the things that they needed for their tools, um, the glass that they needed, and everything that was required for their experiments. Everything had to be made in-house. So it was, in a way, referred to as sort of the sealing wax and shoestring uh, way of doing things. If you needed something, you created it. You've got the, the glass blowers in-house to create you the right shape glass and you've got the carpenters to knock you up something in wood so everything was actually done in-house and the amount of equipment that they had for the first opening would have fitted onto a paper that size handwritten not not typed so it wasn't a, a huge amount if you go along to the new cavendish out on the west cambridge site they actually have a wonderful exhibition a museum there and you can see the first list of equipment and you can see some of the early equipment that they they used in here 
Now, at the time that this opened, 1874, it was very soon after women had just been accepted into the university. There were two colleges, Newnham and Girton. James Clark Maxwell, he was a Scot. I'm talking world of science, let's move up to Scotland. He was a Scot, but a rather an isolated character. Particularly didn't like women, and he wasn't going to have women in his lectures. So the, the women at Newnham asked for their own laboratory to be created. And for the, the others, when James Clark Maxwell went back to Scotland in the summer for the holiday time, the women would then move in for the long vacation term and they would pack into one term three terms worth of work. So the, the story of, of women in, in Cambridge is very slow to, to develop. It wasn't actually until 1948 that they accepted full status for women and they granted the first honorary degree to Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother. Uh, before that, there, there were growing numbers of women, and they were eventually allowed in here, although they would often find that sitting um, in the rows with the men, the man lecturer would walk in and say, good morning, gentlemen, and he'd totally ignore the, the women. So I think they had to fight their, their corner somewhat. to the new Cavendish, what's this used for? They still do some of the teaching here. It is split between the two sites, which is why all Cambridge students need a bicycle right. in order to... In fact, they've created a lovely bike path straight out there so that they, they keep them off the, the main roads. Um, I'm going to talk about this round building, but the story actually starts with the tower, which is facing me. Can you see it's been cleaned? The, the tallest mm -hmm. part on the left, the tower, is known as Rutherford's Tower because Ernest Rutherford came here in 1895 from New Zealand and he was one of the first foreign graduate students to be allowed to, to come here and um, he hastened to take up his place in the, the Cavendish laboratory. Now he could only spend two years here as a postgraduate and then he had to move on and he actually went to Canada and then to Manchester where he did a lot of the work for which he's known for um, analysing the, the atom and then came back here and eventually became head of the Cavendish Laboratory. Now, he was apparently quite a, a big man, very much, um, he was born in the Victorian period, and we're talking early 1900s, by the time he's back here, we're talking of somebody who treats the place rather like a headmaster would treat the school of, uh, you know, he would come in and check out what everybody was doing in their experiments and, um, it, it was on the sort of transmit rather than receive, and you know you were very aware of his presence. Big man, you'd hear him coming. Now, in 1919, if we move the story to Russia, we find somebody called Peter Kapitza, and at that time he had a great deal of unhappiness in his life. His wife and two-year-old son had died, and um, a, a small baby as well, and. Russia, with the science scene, were just beginning to send some of their scientists around the world to have a look at other people's equipment and to pick up science equipment. And so in 1921, as he felt there wasn't a lot to keep him back home uh, to get away from this sad scene, he started travelling. And he ended up here in Cambridge. And he approached Rutherford and said, I'd really like to join your team. Well, Rutherford looked around, he said, well, no, actually, I have got enough PhD students at the moment. Go away, I've got enough researchers under my feet. I don't need any more. Well, Kapitza was not put off by this. He was very cheeky. He asked a question. He said, could you tell me what margin of error you allow for in your experiments? And Rutherford looked at him rather strangely and thought about this. And he said, well, we're up to 3%. So Kapitza then did a head count of 30. And he said, well, I think if you allow me in, you're within your, your margin of error. Please let me come. And he came and made himself invaluable and eventually was given the, the post of head of the low temperature physics department. And by 1930, they had built him this with money from the ICI Mond um, Foundation, the big Mond. And it was built, it's very sort of Art Deco style, it was built in brick with um, this part of the, the wall covered up right until the, the grand opening. Nobody knew why that was covered up. It turned out that um, secretly, so that Rutherford could not see this, Kapitza had had this carved on the side by a very eminent sculptor who's called Eric Gill. 
And if you look up into the mouth where the tongue is, they're actually the initials EG, it's a little curly EG. And this is really uh, a reflection on how Kapitza considered Rutherford. He himself explained it in, in different ways. It was partly that um, a crocodile cannot turn to look backwards, so scientists have to be forward looking. It was another explanation of his was that the Russians look on the, the crocodile as uh, the, the father, the, the head of the family, or perhaps it's the other way around. But the third one is the story of Peter Pan. And in Peter Pan, the crocodile swallowed the clock and you could hear it ticking. So you always knew when the crocodile was coming. And I think with Rutherford being a big man and Kapitza liking to, to smoke, he would hear him coming. You could see the, the cigarette or the pipe being put out and Rutherford sort of tended to send things flying. So you'd sort of gather up all your stuff and make sure that nothing happened. So it's got several sides to it, this crocodile. But he took it further than this. The key was in the shape of a crocodile. The mascot on the front of his car was in the shape of a crocodile. So he took this to extremes. Unfortunately, by 1934, um, Kapitza made one of his regular trips back to Russia and the Russians decided at this point that they would close the doors on their scientists and he was to stay put. And this was not long after he'd just set up here. So Cambridge University very kindly packed up all his equipment and parceled it off to the laboratory in Moscow. But we're just a few years before the beginning of the Second World War here. And I think it left people this side and the Americans wondering whether or not he might be working on something that would lead towards an atomic bomb. In fact, he was asked to do so in Moscow, but he refused, and so he was kicked out of the laboratory uh, for the duration of the war, and was only allowed back in at the end of the war. Now, he did come back here, I and mean, he's, he's long since died, but he came back here in the 1980s, and he was a member of Trinity College. And if you ever go to, to college for a formal dinner, the requirement is that you wear a gown. And apparently, Kapitza turned up at the, the door and sort of very humbly said, well, I don't think I can come to the meal tonight because I don't have a gown any longer. And one of the porters said, just one moment, sir. And he scurried through to the, the coat pegs near the, the hall and reached up and took the um, gown off the peg that still had Kapitza's name inside. And he said, your gown is still here, sir. So he was allowed to come. We're commemorating somebody we want you to know about. We put up round blue plaques, but in the university they go for these discreet brown ones. And this one tells you that it was the Queen's husband, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh, who unveiled this plaque, commemorating the event in 1953 when James Watson and Francis Crick established the, what the structure of DNA was. Now, the two of them, James Watson and American Francis Crick, um, 10, 12 years older than James Watson, uh, had both been working here together at a point when um, there came Morris Wilkes and Rosalind Franklin. And Rosalind Franklin had been looking at X-ray um, crystallographic images and was beginning to think along the lines that eventually it turned out that the structure of DNA was a double helix, but she couldn't see that it was a double helix. It took these two to come along and the accusation is that they stole her work. Well, it's, it's, it's a very strange story. And it's an interesting read, if ever you have time, to actually look through the whole story and to make your own assessment of, of how it worked. Um, but Rosalind Franklin's images were actually sort of slipped by their own head, Morris Wilkes, to um, the two of them. And what they did with these images was, it was the same as if you've got a bright sunny day and everybody's casting a shadow on the ground and you look at the image of the shadow and you say without seeing who's made the shadow you say well that shape there that's somebody who's you know uh, five foot nine they've got dark hair and um, you know light colored skin and you could tell that from the shadow on the ground the image that they saw was uh, you know i find it in, impossible to, to understand how they worked it out but what they came up with in the laboratory to explain how it all worked was something that looked like that. They took bits and pieces from around the, the lab and built up uh, a model, which we now do on the, the computer, of the, the one at the bottom, to explain that it is a double helix shape. The two of them 
uh, and Morris Wilkins were uh, awarded a Nobel Prize, but not Rosalind Franklin. And people get worried about this, that she was a woman and we're ignoring women in history here. Well, whatever the truth of the matter is, she could never have been awarded a Nobel Prize at that time because she had died and they do not award them posthumously. And she wasn't the head of her department either, so it was the head and the two here who were awarded the, the Nobel Prizes. As I said, it's, it's brown parts with the university. And this one is telling you about the, the world's first computer with memory, with stored memory. And it was called EDSAC, which stands for Electronic Delay Storage Automatic Calculator. And it was a team led by Morris Wilkes uh, who were building on what had happened in America um, four years earlier. And this was ENIAC, which was uh, another numerical machine, but it didn't have any way of storing the information. Whereas this one, they used tubes of mercury, which would then um, enable them to, to gather the information. And it became a vital source for everybody working around and about. People could book time to come and use EDSAC. I have to say on that day, on 6th of May 1949, it ran for two minutes and 32 seconds. So it wasn't long run for its first effort. Um, it would have filled a room about the size of this building on the corner here. And it would have been valves, not the little electro electronic components that we now use. It had about 32 bytes of memory. So we wouldn't consider it huge these days at all. But it did mean that people's calculations could be speeded up immensely. It was um, not long after we'd actually created a computing department. Now, computing, in a way, started with somebody else here in Cambridge, and that was Charles Babbage. Um, Charles Babbage, we call him the grandfather of, of computing. And I have um, an image of the thing that he created, uh, a difference engine this time. We wouldn't call it a, a calculator at all, but it was a, a big piece of equipment full of cogs that turned and it was supposed to be a, a way of um, doing the sort of calculations that people had done beforehand. Unfortunately, the engineers at the, the time, and we're talking the 1820s, were not able to finely tune the pieces of metal well enough for it to really work. But it was the beginning of a man realising that you could use machinery to do the sort of calculations that only a, a brain had done before. Now, Charles Babbage was a, a wealthy individual. He didn't need to, to work, but he did at one time. Uh, working on insurance tables, uh, mortality tables, and these were inevitably wrong because of human error, which is what drove him to, to try and get a machine to, to do the calculations. But we have him to thank also for the cow catcher that goes on the front of a train, and for the knowledge that you can count the rings on a tree and get its age. And um, he decided one day that his pet hate was the hurdy-gurdy men in, in London, the men who came with their music boxes and would sit outside his window making music in the hope of making money. And so he, he had a, a council edict to say, we've got to clear the streets of these. And they retaliated. They came back all together one night under his window and all played together. So um, they weren't very happy with his decision. <laughs> so was he a mathematician? Or? He was a mathematician. And in fact, he worked with, have you heard of Lord Byron, the poet? Byron's um, one daughter, and he had um, various illegitimate ones, but the one true daughter was called Ada, and she worked with him, and the two of them were very keen to work out um, a system on horse racing. Um, but we do have the, the name Ada is used for uh, American security computer language, I think. And they actually use Ada, which is not initials of anything, it is after Ada Byron. I said when we were by the garden that this area is called the New Museum site, and here we have one of the museums. It's a teaching museum for the university. It's the Museum of Zoology, and it is effectively a collection made in the 19th century of animals, um, their skeletons, which you would not be able to replicate now because it would not be considered uh, politically correct to go and choose an animal, kill it, and prepare its skeleton. Um, we just don't 
do things like that anymore. We'd probably go and take photographs and weigh and measure it and then let it go. But in those days, it was fine to go collecting. So this is actually quite an unusual collection these days. Lots of collections have been broken up and disappeared. But here we've got one that started then. And in the 1970s, they rehoused it in this building. Um, if you go in, it's, it's worth... Uh, having a look and starting at one of the exhibitions, working your way around, you'll sort of follow the timeline of the development of single-celled beings right round. Down below, there's um, more animal skeletons. You've got the blackened one in the middle, which is an aurochs, which is extinct. You've got this one just hanging to the left of us, which is a monodon monoceros. And if you get yourself in a position either above or below it, you'll see that it's a narwhal that has not just one tusk, but two, which is rather unusual. You just have to position yourself so that you're looking at the, the right direction. It's a, it's a brilliant museum. It yeah. is a, an excellent museum to go and spend some time. And it, it's moved away from the time when it was only partially open to the public because it was a teaching museum all the time. So during term time, um, the public really weren't very welcome because uh, you, know, you couldn't teach with people wandering around. Now they've actually separated the, the teaching area so that for most of the, the um, term time and holidays, um, this one is, is open to the public and it's free. We are looking at a colossal skeleton. I wonder if you know what it is. Do you know what it is? It's a, it's a whale. You're absolutely right. It's a finback whale, which is the second largest species of whale. And it's a creature that died 1869 in Pevensey. And it was a rare sight even in those days. And such an extraordinary sight that they put on a special excursion train from London to take people down to, to see it. And to make it more exciting for them when they got there, they put a little orchestra in the ribcage playing so that people had some entertainment once they arrived. Now, um, being a, a, a whale, it's uh, got its filter system in place here. You've got the filter plates and the hairs still as they would have been. It, it is the actual skeleton itself. It's not a, a cast of it. So. Um, it's weathering away out here, but it is an advertisement that you see as you come through the gate in this direction for the Zoology Museum. It's also indicating that it is a creature that has evolved. As you look down the spine, there is one single bone hanging. Um, if you follow the spine down, you can see one uh, horizontal bone hanging, which actually is a vestigial pelvis. It's indicating that this creature at one time had legs, and that's where they joined onto the, the body. And when we talk about evolution, that brings us to another character from Cambridge, and that's Charles Darwin, who went on to write his theory on the evolution of species. Now, I've actually got a picture of Darwin in his 70s here. This is Charles Darwin. He set out to be um, a doctor, a medical man, started his studies in Edinburgh. Uh, but discovered that he really was rather squeamish, so that wasn't a good idea to, to be a doctor. So his father, in disgust, sent him down to Cambridge University to be a, a priest. He was going to uh, train to, to be a priest. But as soon as he had qualified, um, as he had graduated, uh, there came available a post as the ship's captain's companion on the Beagle ship. Now the Beagle was one of the ships on the mapping expedition. They were using um, ships that had taken part in the Napoleonic Wars um, for another use. They no longer needed them for war, so they sent them off doing um, civic work, which was to create maps around Tierra del Fuego. And I've actually got a, a map of the, the world here showing him setting off from England and going across here to um, where the ship was destined to go and make maps. The reason he needed to go was not as a scientist, because that thought didn't exist then really, of a travelling scientist. It was to be the ship's companion, the captain's companion. There had been a, a history of captains getting very depressed and being suicidal. The previous captain had in fact committed suicide. So to keep Captain Fitzroy uh, more uh, comfortable and companionable, they sent along somebody who would actually be able to have dinner with him the rest of the ship's staff could not eat with the captain. He, was, he had to be superior, he was not allowed to mix in that way. So they sent him somebody uh, who would actually be a, a friend to him. Every time the ship got near land, Darwin would hop off and go exploring. When he had been studying here, he had gradually developed uh, an interest in all natural things, particularly in um, uh, 
thinking of. I'm thinking of Sedgwick and the what sort of museum is it? It's got stones geology. And things. Geology. geology. That's the word. The geology museum. Um, he had gone out walking with Sedgwick here. He was known as the man who walked through with Sedgwick. And abroad, he sent back everything he collected. Not just stones, but animal skins, plant material. The university received all of these and they were dispersed among the various departments. So this museum has some of the, the things that he sent back, including the skins of the finches that he saw when he got to the Galapagos Islands. And as you travel from one island to another, they had finches that had beaks that were slightly different shapes. And this had, they had evolved so that they could cope with the different food supplies that were to be found on different islands. Some of them needed to be narrow for poking in corners. Some of them needed to be bigger and stronger for cracking open seeds and things. So it depended on what the food source was as to how the finch's beaks had changed. He didn't immediately come home and write this up as a theory. He thought about it for a long time. He realised that he was going down a line of inquiry that would upset a lot of people uh, on a religious ground because the earth did not start, according to him, with God creating uh, things and everything developed from there. It had actually evolved and changed. It was out of God's hands. So he sat on the information for a long time until the threat of somebody else publishing a very similar but you know, slight differences um, theory. And he thought, I'd better, I'd better get down to this and actually put in what I think has happened. So he then published in 1859 on the origin of species and next year being 2009 we will be celebrating the 200th anniversary of the date that no the 150th anniversary 200 since he was born 150th since he published so there will be lots of extra things going on to do with darwin next year has everybody been into the museum or other yeah. people if we haven't it's, it's well worth you coming back and, and having a, a look later. Just come round this way, through the door there. Uh, what they have got is a, a, a rhea that Darwin realised was different from ones on um, neighbouring um, countries and uh, was named for him. And we've got some of the fish that he sent back. They haven't got a lot of his stuff actually out on display. Um, but if you come back after the 24th of March, they are putting on a special exhibition on uh, beetles and things, uh, which he collected. One of the most extraordinary things, apart from the crab, I think is this, that was found in a Cambridge house, this uh, wasp's nest. And you think that the wasps made that in a year, because they don't come back to a nest that they've made, so they made that in a year and then hopefully moved on, but that was to be found in the attic of a, a Cambridge house. <laughs> century geologist. Um, he followed on from uh, another name important in Cambridge which is um, Woodward. The heart of this collection is actually the, the Woodward collection and this was somebody who donated not just his collection but the cabinets to the university. Sedgwick had uh, an ambition to house this collection and to build on it. And it was, it was his interest in geology that I think sparked off Darwin as well. But if we go up and I'll take you through to the wood. Now you come into this sort of museum and the display cases in themselves are museum articles. They did a, a survey a few years ago when they were thinking of making some changes and asked everybody what they would like to see if they changed the, the museum. And among all the answers, it, there was a consistent refrain, don't change the cabinets, please, because people like to see that the, you know, the way that they are displayed. They have to change the way that the information is annotated, so that the sort of information you're given about the things is easier to, to understand if you're not a university student. Sedgwick got a lot of his material from this lady who's up on the wall above us here, uh, Mary Anning. And she was somebody who made her, um, her way through life selling things that she found to people who would be interested in studying them. 
um, things like ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs. But because she was finding these down on the, the beach, we have a little children's refrain about her, which is she sells seashells by the seashore. And the she in that refers to Mary Anning. Now, you're looking at a, a set of cabinets that were made for um, Dr. Woodward. And they, at one time, used to have one of them open to show you the rows of drawers inside. But unfortunately, um, the drop part of the desk started to warp, so they've closed it up, but taken just um, some, well, there's one drawer here, and some of the things out so that you can see. But he had a, a rule never to collect anything that he couldn't actually tell you the provenance of, so he needed to know the history of it. Otherwise, it was useless to him in the story of how uh, how the earth had developed, and the museum has carried that on. They, they have numerous collections, and they're always being offered more collections, but they won't take anything that doesn't come with provenance. Which is about how everybody wanted the changes made. You can see that this gallery was closed for some time, reopened by Sir David Attenborough, and he actually was a member of Clare College, so he does have a strong connection with Cambridge. Earlier we were in Free School Lane and that the school was the Perth Grammar School. The first Perth Grammar School actually started in here and if you go in through the doors and upstairs you'll find that on that side behind this facade is um, a lovely hammer beam roofed hall which was part of the school from early 1600s. It is now occupied by the Whipple Museum which is not open in the morning sometimes not open out of term time, but it's worth a try later in the afternoon to see if it's open this afternoon. In the museum, you will find a collection of scientific instruments. Now, these instruments were ones that were mainly collected by Robert Whipple. And Robert Whipple had started working for Charles Darwin's son, Horace. Horace set up Cambridge Scientific Instruments. I mentioned that to begin with, everything had to be made in-house, but um, Horace had decided that he would actually have a company making equipment and Robert ended up as managing director for this and at one point he picked up in, in France, in Paris, he picked up a small telescope and from that telescope grew his interest in collecting things and he bequeathed this to the university. Well it didn't immediately have a, a home, it didn't end up here until um, around the 1940s but at that point there was such an interest in the, the scientific equipment that they've got inside that um, they have worked out how to incorporate it into the teaching of science. So the history of science instruments is now a taught subject. It's not just something that's left to chance that people are interested in. It's actually part of the science course here. So um, they have a lot of teaching rooms down be below. But the, the museum itself is um, another of these very interesting, well displayed ones. So worth a visit. <laughs> made the discovery about um, pulsars, scintillations. Um, I've actually heard him talk, and he gave a fascinating talk about the uh, one of the um, first um, telescopes that they set up. And uh, I've got a picture here of something I wouldn't have thought looked like a telescope, but this is it, a radio aerial telescope. And he said that uh, Martin Ryle was the, the head of the department, and uh, another Nobel Prize winner, two Nobel Prize winners here, um, Martin Ryle had been a sailor, so when he designed these aerials, they looked very much like shipping masks, big yacht masks. And come winter time, with harder winters, they would often get covered in ice. And it was apparently Anthony Hewish's job to climb up and knock the ice off overnight. Um, I do have some other, other photographs. of um, This is um, one out in Cambridge at Lord's Bridge. Uh, again, looking like aerials. And this one is not here, but in Hawaii, but it's named after James Clark Maxwell, the one at the bottom there. Um, if I just read you what it says about them, the Cambridge Low Frequency Telescope consists of 60 aerials along a five kilometer base line. Each day it produces a picture of the radio sky at two meter wavelength, showing many hundreds of radio galaxies and quasars. That's the, the top one that looks like TV aerials. And the, uh, the one at the bottom, the James Clark Maxwell tele uh, Telescope, operates at radio wavelengths of less than one millimetre. 
the Earth's atmosphere was not very, uh, was not very transparent at such short wavelengths. So this one is located at Manau, Ma uh, Mornau, uh, Key at Hawaii, and it's 4,200 meters high. So they've actually got up to where the air is um, thinner, it gets less interruption. Actually, there was one more, and what was that? I was going to show you, which was, I think, of what a pulsar apparently looks like. Again, an image. We've got a, an image there. Lovely, colourful image, isn't it? Um, yes, yeah, so strong history of uh, astronomy here. We've come to the Eagle Inn. I'm not suggesting we have a pub stop. We've uh, had enough and it's time for a beer. It's to, to tell you the, the next instalment of the story about DNA, because this is where Francis Crick and James Watson used to come over lunchtime, and they would sit diagonally opposite behind that door, um, and over their pint of beer and their pie in February 1953. They announced to everybody who was willing to listen to them that they found the secret of life and they now knew what the structure of DNA was, double helix. Now, I have to say that over in the, the laboratory, I think when they made the announcement there to everybody, they maybe didn't get the attention that they, they deserved. We, we had a talk by um, one of the lab laboratory technicians who said that actually when they were doing that work, everybody else in the laboratory was playing with a slinky. Do you know what a slinky is? One of those spiral toys that you start at the top of the stairs and it goes over and over oh, yeah. and over. And I think everybody had their heads down over this slinky and, oh, you, you've discovered that about DNA? Well, that's interesting. But what's the maths behind this slinky? So they didn't get the acclaim with their, uh, their peer group over there. But over here, I, I expect everybody raised their glass to them. And if you go into the, the pub, there is actually a plaque on the wall behind where they used to, to sit. So uh, that's the connection with the, the eagle here. Now, they may have mentioned this in February 53 here, but they didn't actually publish their findings in the Nature magazine until April of that year. So this commemorates the April date, 25th of April, and James Watson himself came back and unveiled the, the plaque. Um, as I said earlier, Francis Crick, although English, was living in America, but he was uh, older by about 12 years and too frail to travel at the time and has since died. Uh, but James Watson, a member of Clare College, does come back from time to time. He came back a few years ago and gave his college a wonderful silver sculpture of DNA, which is in the Clare grounds across Queen's Road. If you look in one of their gateways there, you'll see this lovely silver sculpture.